1 to 11, so Sue's going to come and read that for us. Good morning, church. Join me in chapter 8, like he said. I need my old lady glasses. Okay. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. So we're in Romans 8 this morning. Uh, I thought it would be good maybe to start out by giving you just a little review. This is our fifth Sunday in what's probably a 15-week series on the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, in John 7, Jesus said, on the last day of the feast, the great day, he stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive in the future, for as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So even when Jesus was on earth through the whole Old Testament era up until the time Jesus walked on earth, uh, there was the Spirit active in one kind of way, but not yet in another kind of way that was yet future after Jesus is glorified. Uh, and so Acts 1, Jesus is now resurrected and he says to the, his disciples, uh, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then we saw that baptism in Acts chapter 2, that was our first Sunday, the day of Pentecost. Uh, what, uh, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house they were sitting and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And Peter says, here's what's happened here. He's telling the crowd that gathered because of this, the great tumult of this wind and this experience. He says, let me tell you what happened here. This is uh, what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So Pentecost is like a hinge, and it's the... Jesus had promised it in John 14. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or, nor knows him. You, so here's the key, it seems to me. You know him, he says to his disciples before his death and he's glorified and Pentecost. You know him for he dwells now with you 
but he will be in you. You see the distinction there? He dwells now with you. Yes, the Spirit was active and moving and powerful among the people of God in the Old Testament era, but after Pentecost, he will be in you. And that's our subject today. (laughs) What does it mean for the Spirit of God to be in us, the the indwelling of the, the, the Spirit? And so we're turning to Romans 8 to get an answer to that question. And I'm certainly not going to do entire justice to Romans 8, 1 to 11, but I'm going to give you the big picture of Romans 8, 1 to 11. See the spirit progression from the outward to the mental to the heart. And then we're going to talk about applications of this inner life of the spirit dwelling in us. So first, and you've got your outline there if you want to follow along, we're talking about this progression in Romans 8 from the outward to the inward. And you see first that we walk according to the Spirit, and that's the subject of verses 1 to 4. Paul has said in Romans 7, and maybe if you're familiar with it, you remember these words, the very thing I want to do, I don't do, and the very thing I don't want to do, I do. Oh, who will deliver me from this bondage, this slavery to my flesh? I mean, I was standing out there, I I told you I ate like a pig, right, in the in Istanbul, well, I can barely get my belt to keep the same notch here, so I got to start doing something about that. So I've been telling myself no sweets. Well, I don't know who brought the stuff this morning, but <laughs> I'm standing out there talking to somebody, and there's this incredible stuff right in front of me, standing there by the, and I'm, you know, just okay, the, the, the little bit. Of, oh, good grief! Why the very thing I don't want to do, I do, and. The, I mean, that's because of the flesh, right? There's this power, there's this allurement of the flesh that tugs at us. There's this allurement of the world we talked about in the Revelation series that pulls at us and draws us, and we need to be broken of the power of that so that we can live in a new way. And that's what he's describing here in Romans 8. So, yes, there's this power of the flesh and the law over us, Romans 7, but there is the potential to walk in a new way. The law of the spirit of life, verse 2, has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin, condemning sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk now, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And we're going to talk more about this next week when we get to verses 12 and 13, the sanctifying power of the Spirit to live and walk in a new way. No longer slaves to the flesh, able to overcome and experience victory over temptation and fleshly weakness, because of the enlivening work of the Spirit in us so that we can live in obedience to God's commands. We're released from the condemnation and failure of the law and the flesh because Christ paid the penalty for our sins, and so we have a new ability by the Spirit in us to keep the law because God dwells in us by His Spirit. So, walking according to the Spirit, verses 1 to 4, setting our mind on the things of the Spirit in verses 5 to 8. So now we're going a little deeper, the outward behavior to the inner workings of the mind. Mind here in verses 5 to 8, those who set their minds on the flesh, you see in verse 5, those who set their minds on the things of the Spirit, verse 5, there's this contrast between the two. The mindset is our orientation, it's our convictions, it's our worldview, it's that which steers our course of Life And we're born with minds set on the flesh. Our orientation is that of the world. We love the things of the world. We're immersed in the things of the world. We hope in the things of the world. We seek the things of the world. Believers who have a new mind because of the Spirit in them view the whole world in a different way. It's a new framework. It's a new lens. It's a new perspective. It's new desires. It's new purposes and 
goals so that we can keep our commitments. We can walk in integrity. We are more realistic about life. Our hopes are placed in different places because we're grounded in a confidence now that the world can only marvel and wonder at. And so I just, this morning, I get these news things, you know, every morning. And one of them, one of the, one of the headlines this morning was 70% of Americans say that the election is causing them significant stress. 70% say the election is causing them significant stress. Why? Well, because they're fearful of what will happen if their candidate doesn't get elected, right? I mean, uh, and you've heard the, uh, the, the language that is used in the press is, is cataclysmic, you know, the, and the language used by both parties in this polarization is that, you know, it's, it's like um, apocalyptic kind of language, like the end will come if your candidate doesn't get elected president in this election. That's the, that, that's the kind of language we're hearing every day. Is it really so? <laughs> where, wh what is our mindset? Where is our hope? And if your mind is set on just the things of this world, the only worldview you have, okay, I, uh, another aside, uh, I went to the eye doctor at Wolf Clinic in uh, uh, Des Moines this week because I got all this stuff over my eyes. And, <laughs> and they, made, they put me in front of this screen and they had me, okay, every time you can see the light, click this thing. And I'm there, I'm not clicking anything because all the lights are apparently way up here and I can't see it, <laughs> any of those lights. Turns out I qualify for a facelift. <laughs> So they referred me to a plastic surgeon. So if you see me looking, you know, 10 years younger, like, whoa, look at that. Uh, it's only because I can't see. That's the deal. Well, you know, so if you're in the world, there's all this there's, this, there's another realm you can't even see, right? You don't even know it's there. You've just got this horizontal perspective. But those who have the spirit in them see an entirely different realm in the heavens that gives them a hope that nobody else has. That's what happens when the Spirit comes in you. So your, your life has changed, you do things differently, your mind has changed because, getting to the deeper reality, we are indwelt by the Spirit. And that gets us down to verses 9 to 11. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. And that's the essence of our topic this morning, the spirit of God dwelling in us. Uh, verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So three times, that's obviously why I came to this text to talk about the indwelling of the spirit. You see it three times there, this word for the spirit in us. So to come to Christ is not just to adopt a different set of standards, okay? I once lived by these standards, now I live by these standards, so I do different things. That's not the essence of Christianity. The essence of Christianity is not even worldview. It's not even philosophy. It's not even foundational principles in my mind. Those things are important, what we do and how we think, but they're not the bottom. They're not the ground. They're not the essence of what it means to be a child of God. No, the essence is that God's spirit comes to live in you. The word dwell actually comes from the word for house. God comes to live in you. He makes his home in your heart. In fact, when I was a young Christian, uh, I was in the Navigators, and they had all these little booklets. And nav Navigators loved their little little booklets to, on different topics. And one of the one of the little booklets was "My Heart, Christ's Home." <laughs> when I came to faith in Christ, Christ came to live in me. That changes 
everything. My heart, Christ, home. God taking up residence in us. There's something mysterious about it, of course. There's something we don't fully understand. But what does it mean when Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Well, you know, I showed you pictures and we went out. I mean, half of what happens when you go to these hub meetings like this happens in a restaurant, right? Because, yeah, you can have your formal meetings and different things, but when you sit down and eat together and you start asking, well, tell me about your children and tell me about your church and tell me what kind of challenges you've been facing with all these refugees coming in and you have this conversation and you eat together and you share at the table together, I mean, that's a kind of fellowship that is the bottom, really, of fellowship, right? That's why hospitality is such a powerful thing because you invite people into your home and you eat together and you serve them and you laugh and you tell stories and you get to know each other. And Jesus says, I come to live in you and eat with you. That's the indwelling of the Spirit. It's a term of nearness, a term of communion, a term of intimacy, a term of presence of God with us. In the Old Testament, where was God present? If you wanted to meet God, where did you go? That's a real question. Would anybody want to give me an answer? You went to the temple, right? Yeah, if you wanted to meet with God, you went to the place of God's presence, which was the temple. I want to get near to God. I want to meet with God. I have to go to where God is, which is the temple. Where is the temple today? <laughs> There's a whole bunch of temples right here, right? I mean, 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Where is the presence of God in the church age in which we live? It is in you. You are the temple of God. You are the place of the presence of God. You don't have to go anywhere to meet with God. He's right there, right here. He dwells in you. God is present here with us as his temple. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? We are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. If this is true, then four practical things are true and you've got them there in your outline. First, those indwelt by the Spirit belong to God. Verse 9, you, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So there are only two categories of people, those who are in the flesh and do not belong to God, and those who are indwelt by the Spirit and belong to God. If the Spirit of God is, dwells in you, you this is last week, right? Uh, Isaiah, uh, when God says to you, you are mine, or in uh, 1 Peter, you are a people for my own possession. This is God's ownership over us to care for us, to protect us, to provide for us. You belong to to God. He says of you, you are mine, my people, my possession. And the application of this is, of course, security. <laughs> I am held fast in the arms of this loving God who calls me his. I've other surveys on what ails our culture today, there's an identity crisis there is a loneliness crisis. What's the answer for these two epidemics? <laughs> well, my identity is found in God who says, you are mine and I'm never alone because God dwells in me. And the indwelling of the spirit is the answer for what ails our world. The spirit of God in us, secure in him. Second, 
the indwelling of the Spirit that is the indwelling of Christ. And this can get a little confusing, but it's certainly true. Uh, Look at verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ, what? Does not belong to him, but if Christ is in you, so which is it? (laughs) The Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ? And of course, this is one of those Bible answers where you say yes. (laughs) Uh, Both and to have the Spirit in you is to have Christ in you. When Christ says, better for you to go away because I'm going to send the Helper. And when the Helper comes, I will be with you. Lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. How? Why? Because the Spirit of God dwells in us. And so the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ living and dwelling within us, one and the same. Is Jesus with you? Yes. Is the Spirit in you? Yes. Uh, uh, The indwelling of the Spirit is the manner and means of the presence of Jesus with us. We abide in him, John 15, by his Spirit who is in us. In fact, there's a profound Trinitarian reality here because verse 9 in the, uh, you do, or, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God <laughs> dwells in you. Uh, the spirit of God is, the spirit of Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And it's this Trinitarian reality so that we are brought into, the application of this is intimacy. Somehow we are brought into the very Love and communion that exists between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we are brought right into this intimacy and communion in such a way that we share in the same intimacy that is that between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, I don't fully understand this. There's a mystery to this, but that's what Jesus says in John 17. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. In the same way that the Father is in the Son and the Son is in the Father, we are in the Father and the Son by the Spirit who dwells in us. There's this intimacy of relationship. There's this communion between us and God as we are drawn into this perfection of love that exists between the three members of the Trinity. And that means then, thirdly, the indwelling of the Spirit gives life. If we're brought into that fellowship and that communion, that Trinitarian reality, verse 10, if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, The spirit is life because of righteousness. Or the NIV says the spirit gives life. Or the New Revised Standard, the spirit makes alive. I think this is the same life. Just look at verse 6 where it says, For the mind set on flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. It's It's a present experiential reality of life because the Spirit of God is in us. Sin kills, but the Spirit gives life. The inner influence of the Spirit is a life-giving, joy-instilling, empowering presence. It's a vital, present, vivifying, satisfying, uh, enriching reality such that we have everything we need provided for us through the Spirit who is in us. The application is vitality. We truly live as God meant us to be by the Spirit who indwells us. Remember John 7, this was the promise. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He said this about the spirit 
who those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit had not yet been given, but now he has. And so we come and we drink and we're satisfied of soul in such a way that not only are we enriched, but we are enrichers. Because as we drink to our satisfaction, these rivers of water of life flow out of us into those around us as we are energy givers and life givers in the sphere of influence that God has given to us wherever we go this week, empowered to live in a new way that brings life to where we go because of the spirit who is in us. And then the fourth application is the indwelling of the spirit is eternal life. So I think it's two different lives here. <coughs> I think 10 is present. I think 11, <coughs> excuse me, 11 is future. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, <coughs> oh, that water just went down the wrong. <coughs> Sorry about that. He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life, I think eternal life, to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. In you. So, yeah, there's this death in the flesh and the body, but there's a future life as Jesus was raised, so we shall be raised. The application here is certainty. I was just at the Baptist Convention of Iowa annual meeting the last two days and one of the staff members of the Baptist Convention of Iowa was a semi-retired pastor named Ed Gregory and Ed uh, has served the BCI the last 10 years as a pastoral care person especially in northeast Iowa just he just goes around doing kind of what I do in Latvia that's what Ed does in northeast Iowa he just goes to guys has coffee with them has a meal with meal with them and uh, says, you're doing a great work, keep it up. And they talk about challenges they're facing, and he gives a word of encouragement. Ed is dying of cancer, had cancer, thought he beat it, cancer came back. Ed has days or weeks to live. He's hoping to make it to his birthday, 74th birthday, on December 7th. And Ed spoke to us at the convention. And we went to a... 75-minute uh, presentation by Ed. 50, he gave us 58 years of uh, ministry experience. Uh, <clears throat> talked about his life and ministry and lessons he'd learned. Then he got up yesterday and just talked for 10 minutes. And there was this phrase that he used in both settings. Uh, he said, these days, here's what the Lord's saying to me. Go as strong as you can, as long as you can, by the grace of God, for the glory of God, and then go home. <laughs> as strong as you can, as long as you can, by the grace of God, for the glory of God, and then come on home. And he quoted Psalm 23, 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of this life, and then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And it was his certain hope. Ed's not afraid to die. Of course, he's sorry to leave his grandkids and other things, but at an age maybe younger than he expected. But he's not afraid to die because he has an absolute certain hope. Ed knows where he's going. He knows that though he dies, he will rise again because the Spirit of God dwells in him. And that Spirit is his certain confidence of his future destiny and it can be so for us as well that's the work of the spirit indwelling us it's a marvelous work it's a life-giving work it's eternal life certifying work and that's our privilege because God has given us his spirit to dwell in us let's pray together father thank you for this privilege this presence this life-giving, revitalizing, reassuring, all-satisfying, hope-giving presence of your Spirit in us. We are not worthy, 
but Christ paid it all so that we might have this gift, this presence, this pleasure, this power. So let us live as we leave this place in a new way, not keeping lists, not pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps, but by going forth and living out what is in us, which is the very Spirit of God who dwells in us. Let it be so this week to your glory. Amen. I mean, we're taking communion this Sunday, and so as the worship team sings, uh, the cup and the bread are at the tables, and so while they're, while they're singing, you can come and take the uh, bread and the cup, take it back to your seat, and then we will all partake together after, uh, after the song. If you're here today and the Spirit of God dwells in you, that's the only requirement. Join us as we remember what Christ has done for us.